as you're, I'm sure, aware, we have a, the topic is corporate and international venture capital, um, which is really a very, very broad topic. We really have no chance of doing anything really seriously in depth on it. Frankly, there's individual lectures that um, are within here that represent full could represent full seminars or courses. There's one on scenarios where I actually do a seminar on it relating to scenarios. Um, just to get rid, take care of some of the basic things, this is my contact information. I welcome communications from my students and really anyone I've had in my classes is welcome to get in touch now or later if you're involved in a venture or if you'd like some guidance or another set of eyes to look at a deal or a possibility, feel free to get in touch. And I've really, it's been wonderful working with a number of students from MIS um, on projects, on their own projects. And frankly, I've also made some friends which I've later on employed or I've placed in other portfolio companies, etc. So it's been a really wonderful two-way street. Um, I'm also available by appointment. It's best if you could, getting together in person, it's best if you can get up to the Palo Alto area. Um, the emerging environment for ventures is really, really changing. So this is really quite an exciting time to be looking at the area of venture capital. Um, there's just a bunch of new approaches, methodologies, and resources. And as a result, there's just been an incredible explosion in the number and, frankly, the quality of startups. In the last five, ten years, it's been remarkable what we've seen. You know, these are some of, the, some of these new developments which I think are really transforming things. And maybe the first and most important is this idea of super low cost, low entry cost ventures. Um, you see folks doing ventures on starting out of um, basically a $10,000, $5,000. You see software ventures which have scale, which can really grow into possibly public companies being done today. Obviously, there's still a lot of risk associated with it. But on the other hand, a lot of the methodologies that are coming along, I think, really extract the risk out of the space, uh, making it a really much more interesting and attractive situation. So some of these methodologies, one is the Blank customer discovery process. This is work done by Steve Blank. He's actually come, to, he's spoken at a number of these classes here. He's not going to be joining us today. If we have time, I, ha I can show you a video from previous classes where he's spoken. But his basic thought is like, a st you know, people confuse startups with companies. Startups aren't really operating companies. Startups are fundamentally a, s a tool for searching for a company. You start out, you really don't know what it's going to be. You have a hypothesis, and the startup is the vehicle for you to um, find out if there really is a business, if the hypothesis is correct. But his theory and his view, and I really agree with it wholeheartedly, is that um, the usual measures for looking at companies are completely nonsensical when you're dealing with a startup. Um, for example, financial statements, something which you know, I'm sure many of you have spent a great deal of time looking at. You know, what's, a, you know, what's the first year or so of many of these ventures? You know, what's the revenue? Zero. You know, what's the fixed assets? Zero. Um, are you really tracking, are you looking for profits? Not really. Um, you know, what does a balance sheet look like? Completely weird and turn around. You know, it's really, you know, it's really not a company in the way we normally think about it. A company is, a situ is a, an enterprise which has figured out a model for 
for replicating and making money on scale. A startup is not, it's fundamentally an experiment in doing that. And given this assumption, Steve has really put together some wonderful approaches which, you know, frankly, when you hear about them, they're so obvious. It's like, first and foremost, get out of the building. You're not going to, you know, like we're all students, graduate students, you know, we're enmeshed in a world of, um, you know, basically working with books and with ourselves and maybe a few buddies. And the whole, his whole point is you have to go engage directly with the prospective customer and really get a deep, deep understanding of that, that that's the way that you can do it, and find the path, and they're your guides in doing that. There's another whole area, agile development methodologies. Now, I am a bit prejudiced. Agile methodologies are really primarily relevant to, to technology development and primarily really software development. But so much of new so many new ventures are really fundamentally dependent on um, software or hardware development of some sort or another that I think it applies. You know, the classic development approaches, um, really till maybe a few years ago, were it's what's called waterfall development where a group of really smart IT people get together with a client. They figure out, okay, what are your needs? Exactly what are the features, et cetera? Then they go off and do a you know, giant design document, which they then scrub a little bit, et cetera. And then maybe in a year or nine months, they come back to you and say, is this what you want? Now, that's fine for American Express doing a major application you know, which they're going to roll out to their customer base, um, which is basically based in the past. With a startup, by the time they come back in nine months, what you want is radically different. So the whole agile development methodologies are a way of really doing your development hand in hand with the buyer, with your client. So, you know, along with Steve Blank's idea of get out of the building and engage with the client, the you know, agile development methodologies is a process where you develop a very little bit, you know, and you show it, to, is this what you want? And as that happens, the whole course of development is radically different with that kind of back and forth going on between the, the client, etc. Because frankly, many times the client doesn't really know what they need either. They're sort of feeling out in the, you know, in the dark. And you can, you can imagine how between these two things, you're really changing the nature of the venture. First of all, you don't need the millions of dollars to do that development. You're starting on a very, very small scale basis. Secondly, a lot of what you're doing is engaging with the client, and that's not a big expensive thing. You don't need big skyscraper offices. You don't need you know, lots of technology. You don't, you know, it's really you need yourself, your brain, and your idea to go figure it out. Then there's Y Combinator, the incubation approach. How many people, who in this room has heard of Y Combinator? Great. Well, um, you should really learn more about it because it's, in my opinion, it po it's possibly the single most important development in Silicon Valley in the last decade. And it started as a silly little venture by a guy who sold like a $50 million company. And his sense was, was, that, you know, the, was that there's really a problem at the formation stage of these companies in terms of the concept development. And that there was, a, you know, there was really a problem in the overall system for these things to be able to come out. It was too... There was too many barriers for these folks to come out. So typically, you know, if you're doing a venture, let's say your average guy starts out to do a, a new technology venture, um, the, you know, I wonder what you think the chances are of that person gaining, let's say, half a million dollars in funding. 
to sort of develop the idea. You know, obviously the group here is a more educated, more advanced group, but in general I'd say the probability of that happening is maybe one in several hundred, maybe one in a thousand. That's a very, that's, does, you know, many, that means you're really a very, very serious venture to go up to that level. And there aren't that many that make it to that level, so it's, that's the case. If you can believe it, Y Combinator brought in people, they selected um, initially a class of 16 for Silicon Valley and 16 in Boston, and year one, over 65% of those deals got the kind of funding I'm speaking about. Can you imagine from one in several hundred to like 65% and on what? He was giving them like a $15,000 fund, which was really to s support an apartment for the team to live in. And you know, your basic, um, you know, truly basic food for like four to six months. And now the numbers are, you know, are wild. Now I'd say easily 90% of them are, you know, gained that funding. And, um, and it's grown. He's doing like, I don't know, 70 or 80 of these ventures in each class. So you can imagine, he's generated easily like 15, 20 billion dollars in value out of these ventures, and they're just getting started. Like Airbnb, that you might be familiar with, that's the thing where you can use other people's homes or rooms, etc. That's something that came out, of, um, came out of Y Combinator, done by two guys who really weren't technical. Their technical skills were Photoshop. Um, the last round, they went to two and a half billion dollar valuation. And that's, that's based on that original $15,000 investment. Yes? How much did Airbnb raise? Uh, how much has, have they raised? I'm not certain, but I'd, but I'd guess several hundred million. More than a hundred, you think? Oh, yeah. And frankly, with these kinds of valuations, they're taking large chunks of money just to have a war chest. Because they have, you know, simultaneously with Y Combinator, a lot of these ventures have emerged abroad, which are essentially knocking off Y Combinator and other ventures. So, you know, one of the ways they can really defend their ideas is through large amounts of cash, which they're raising. Um, while Airbnb is one of the most successful, it's by no means alone. Dropbox is another one. Actually, one of the original founders of Dropbox was at a former class of, such as this. Um, and then there's crowdsourcing, both in terms of crowdfunding, as well as just crowdsourcing capabilities. And that goes back to really supporting that super low cost, low entry cost ventures. And it's really remarkable. Like one of the exercises we're going to do is, you know, take a look at, it's basically where the student, you know, each, we're going to break up into groups. Each group is going to be looking at another one of these players and then presenting to the rest of the class sort of team, class teaching itself. Um, they're remarkable. They really are remarkable. There's a site called Fiverr, which is, you know, what are you willing to do for five dollars? You know, that was the basic idea. It's an Israeli, two Israeli guys who started this thing. You know, at this point there's probably like, I don't know, maybe 200,000 different offers for five dollars. Um, things like logos. You know, we used to go for like a cheap artist to do like a very rough cut, you know, El Cheapo kind of a project. That would still cost a few hundred dollars. The companies I've been involved in recently, they're typically doing their logos at five dollars out of Fiverr, if you can believe it. Just as one tiny little example. I don't know, a lot of different factors have really changed to ease it. It used to be to set up a corporation or an LLC, you need to spend a few thousand, you know, minimum $5,000 on, frankly, a half-ass lawyer, leave a, you know, for a, you know, a name brand firm, let's, you know, you're starting at 20, and that's really, that really is the starters. You know, a couple of companies which, frankly, I've sold myself, you know, for eight figures and nine figures, 
we did them on, I'm trying to remember the online offer that it is. You know, we did the entire incorporation for like, I don't know, $112 or something. And in 15 minutes, it's amazing. You go on 15 minutes later, later you, have a, you have a company with a tax number, with a state authorization. With, you know, these are sent to you, but you've done all the work you need to do. And frankly, I do a lot of foreign ventures. You know, in the US, you hear people say, oh, the, you know, the regulations are killing us, et cetera. And it's like, what a joke. You know, I have a venture in Brazil right now, and it took us like about a year and a quarter and about $20,000 in legal fees to just set up the most basic, basic little entity for operating. Obviously, in that year and a half, we had to actually do a deal with a real, another existing company to work under them, you know, which is, you know, which is not necessarily comfortable just to be able to operate. So, I don't know, so crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, and then now the crowdfunding platforms are, are coming out. Um, anyone, um, anyone has been involved with any of the crowdfunding platforms? Like Indiegogo or um, any of those? Excuse me? Angel List, right? You're familiar with Angel List? Have you tried to raise money there or invested there? You did. Excellent. Actually, Angel List is one of the companies the teams are going to be looking at. I think it's a great platform. Um, there's others. Um, in any case, you combine all these things together and it really is a new environment and one which really has radically democratized the whole startup space, the whole new venture space. Um, it's remarkable to me, like 10 years ago, uh, just the difference between the difficulty and the risks of starting a venture 10 years ago and today. Um, I thought I'd give you a feel for the agenda. Actually, before I go there, I should make a quick note. The, you know, an attempt at covering a, a topic as broad as we have here in a weekend, frankly, it's a challenge. So the approach I've taken to it is try to do like four or five lectures, which really capture some of the real core basics that you really should, everyone with any interest in the topic of startups or venture capital should be familiar with. But then beyond that, to just give you like in-depth looks at some very specific narrow things so that you get a little bit of a macro view, but then you have several experiences on at a detail level with these things, which I think is where you really get a feel for the nature and the flavor and the feel for these things. So this agenda really reflects that. I'm going to start, you know, we're starting with this intro. I'll give you a really high-level overview about venture capital. I have a feeling some of you are going to find it completely, you know this stuff already, but others don't, so maybe that can do some level setting. And then I thought we'd shift and bring in, I'm going to have through Skype, a piece from corporate venture capital. Um, and in this case, it's an entrepreneur story in dealing with corporate venture capital. And this being international, frankly, most of the speakers that we have and most of the cases are going to have an international flavor. In this case, it's going to be Silicon Artists, which, is a Mad which was a Madrid-based company. The CEO has moved on, and who's, he's actually my partner on that Brazil venture now. Um, and he's based in the UK right now. But he will tell his story. Um, and that was a situation where I was, the, I was running corporate, corporate strategy and new ventures at Tandem Computer and at UB Networks before that. And we did a deal with him. So I thought it would be useful to get like the entrepreneur perspective on corporate venture capital. Now, this is kind of a wild little story. I thought it would have some entertainment value as well. So I don't want to give the sense like this is the way they all are. But it's, but it's fun. And Simon's a great guy. Um, we then are going to take a break. 
and then I'm going to go through a bunch of cases with you. Um, I had a fund called Palo Alto Ventures for a number of years, which I then sold to 21st century venture partners. And we developed some diagnostics. One of the things with, with this venture capital business is that um, you, you, know, you're, you get tons of stuff coming in, and you need to make some judgments about it fairly rapidly. Um, so that you can actually get some work done, etc. So I'm going to share it with you. I mean, in some ways, it's a very obvious diagnostic tool of, hey, how can we take a look at the big picture for these companies? Um, in any case, and through that, I'll go through a bunch of cases with you. One of the things I have to tell you is that a lot of times when you're doing venture capital investing, you see one and you say, oh my God, this is a beauty. This one is going to really make me rich, etc." Others, well, I'm in some of my, thank you, some people I owe are in it and they're sort of pressing me. I'm sort of uncertain. You won't believe it. Oftentimes, it's the one you, you're not sure about that ends up making you a fortune and the one that you completely believed in and had unbelievable success blows up. It's really... There is a, it's really, there's a gambling and uncertain dimension to it, no matter how much analysis, how deep you go in, in your analysis. What I just said now, by the way, runs counter to, you know, a lot of what I'm going to say when we look at the diagnostic tool, because that assumes, hey, you can tell some to some degree what's going to happen with these things based on the strengths and not stuff. Then I thought it would be a good idea to bring someone from the corporate side, rather than the entrepreneur side. Um, we have someone, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Vanak, coming in. She's with SAP, the German company, but they're really a global powerhouse right now. And her work has a lot to do with engaging with the startup community. And she's going to be focusing on those, um, on those experiences. And also give you a feel for the range of capabilities in a large company like SAP for engaging with startups. Everything from, you know, arm's length alliances, marketing alliances, or technology alliances, all the way to, you know, corporate investments, venture capital investments, and, you know, mergers and acquisitions. Um, I then thought we would go in and take a look at the ACE Social Venture Fund. Um, that was one of your assignments, and I hope you've all had a chance to read the, read the case. It's interesting. I thought that's a way of bringing social ventures into our discussion. And frankly, many of the measures, the way you would look at a social venture and looking at a for-profit venture are the same. For example, what's the most important thing in looking at a venture? The team. Whether it's a social venture or a for-profit venture, you're still going to look really deeply at the team as the first and most important element you're going to take a look at. You're going to take a look at the need for it. You're going to look at their technical prowess. You're going to take a look at the, you know, a number of elements, the positioning, et cetera. These are all true. The, only, the thing that really changes dramatically in a social venture is that the objective is different. The objective isn't making money. The objective is doing some social good. And so this case really focuses in on how do we measure and compare social good? when you're trying to choose across projects, et cetera. Um, just to be on the safe side, I've printed out a couple, two or three copies of the case in case some of you didn't get a chance to read it. And I'll leave it on the over here for you to take a look at, um, I guess, at lunch break, if you like. I then was going to go to, we have another guest, um, this one from Brazil. And he will be, both Jacqueline and Eduardo will be here in person. Um, and this is a VC-backed venture in Brazil going global. Um, they're probably, the company is Movil. It's a super, super hot, super successful um, venture in the, essentially bringing in the mobility space in Latin America. They're the largest in Brazil. They're spreading throughout the continent. And I thought this would be a nice one to look at 
Whereas, you know, in terms of the first one you were looking at, Silicon Artists, that was a small little venture that was like a little sidekick to a large company. Here, this is a venture that's already on its way to being a major, major player. They have like 20 million users at this point. That's a serious thing. Their valuation is a big, big valuation at this point. And they're trying to glo go global now. They're trying to fall in the ranks of companies like Apple and Facebook, et cetera, which sounds very, very ambitious, but really looking at them and tell, hearing their story, it doesn't seem so far-fetched. Um, in any case, here we've gone back to, the, um, to a venture, and then I'm going to give you your assignments before the day is over um, on, for doing this crowdfunding or crowdsourcing. That's where you're going to be breaking up into teams of about five or six people apiece. You'll get assigned one of these platforms to look at, and you'll have to prepare a five to ten minute presentation for the rest of the class, something that we'll, you'll be delivering tomorrow morning. So that's what we have for the first day. So you can see I've sort of reduced the work I have to do by dramatically handing off to a lot of friends and colleagues. Um, Day two is similar. Um, I'm going to give you the sort of the high level view on corporate venture capital initially. From the investor perspective, really more focusing there. And then we have another person coming in through Skype tomorrow morning, um, Luis, who's um, both a professor um, at uh, one of the leading universities in Spain. Um, he's a professor of entrepreneurship. He's also the managing director of a very successful venture fund that does early stage internet consumer plays. It's quite focused. He's great. He's a really wonderful, smart guy. With a, I like him a lot. Um, we will then um, do the, then you will be delivering your presentations to the rest of the class um, based on preparation you've done this evening. And then we'll come back and I'll do a talk on de deal structure and control. Frankly, this is sort of like some of the real s serious meat and potatoes of it. Like, how does a VC control the venture that they back? How do they keep them from sort of going off doing things? And there's a lot of control mechanisms in place. Um, but that can be dry, it can be technical, etc. But I think it's necessary as part of the overall picture. Um, we're then going to shift to, again, a startup. This one's a Canadian company um, out of Montreal. Dominique um, Jodan is coming in. Actually, he's flying from Tokyo this evening um, for delivering this. This is also really interesting. In It's early stage. They've only done their seed round. They're about to do their first venture capital round. Um, what's really interesting about it, and it's the other thing I wanted to get a feel for, is this is based on university research. So some really solid research had been done. You know, he's the entrepreneur who recognized it, went there, licensed it, and is now making a run with it. So what's cool about that one is that there's real serious technology substance, patents, et cetera, which has been done over many years at a in a university environment. Um, I think you'll find these as being interesting opportunities, and I think these are emerging as a larger part of the market than, than previously. Um, he's also interesting. Um, Dominique is interesting because he started with like 20 years at Ericsson, um, the European play telecommunications player. And now he's gone to the venture fund side, sort of giving you a feel you know, for various trajectories that you may be taking over your, the course of your careers. Um, then time allowing, I'll do a talk about scenarios. Um, scenarios is basically storytelling as a vehicle for understanding the future. So um, I, had a, I had gotten a, um, several years ago, um, I had gotten an assignment from Philips. While I had Palo Alto Ventures, 
um, Philips Electronics approached us with a very substantial um, consulting contract as well as the ability to manage some funds for them, um, which we did. Um, frankly, in that case, I decided to really bet the farm on a serious look at scenarios for the future of consumer electronics. In part, I did that because I didn't know consumer electronics. I had worked in the computer industry, in the networking industry, the fashion industry, but fr frankly, consumer electronics were really kind of new to me and it seemed like doing scenarios is a really good way to engage and figure out, okay, what is this really about? How, you know, what are the factors without, em without embarrassing myself? Um, it turned out to be a really wonderful thing. So what are scenarios? Scenarios is where, you know, in our case, you said, we're gonna take a look at what's the consumer electronics industry like in five years? You, you select a time frame, five to 10 years is quite common as a thing. And then you go and you talk to a ton of people internally, but more importantly, you go and talk to a ton of people outside the company, outside of your own circle, um, about their views of the future. And it's very unconstructed kinds of conversations that you're having with these people. And you make sure you don't only speak with the quote experts, but you're also engaging with the marginal types, the poets, the crazies, the, the artists looking at the space so that you have sort of a broader feel for it. And then you come back with these things and you figure, what are some of the themes that we are seeing in all these? And then based on that, you start constructing four stories of what the future is going to be. You describe the future. The primary part is, you know, it's now 2020. And, you know, you're describing the environment and you describe how we got there from here. So it's got to be coherent. It's got to be real. In any case, we did that as the foundation for doing alliances, for doing strategy work, and of course for doing equity investments. Frankly, that one-year contract has been one of the most incredibly successful things I've ever done. Um, both from the venture side, one of the companies we backed was TiVo. And this is something you'll see sometimes in venture capital. We put in 10 million into TiVo um, on behalf of Philips. Nine months later, we took out 190 million. So it's really possible to do like crazy big numbers and being done by a handful of people. My team was, you know, the venture team on the, on the Philips whole project, Leave Alone TiVo, was like four guys. And, you know, obviously we don't get all that gain, but, you know, even 10, 20 percent of that is a, you know, is a substantial number. Anyway, that's scenarios. And finally, um, we have a piece on entrepreneurial ecosystems around the world. Um, there was a study, um, there's a professor, Steve Chensky, at Stanford Business School, who was, um, he and several others, at Stanford were, were approached by the World Bank to do, a, you know, to do a real study of like basically the ecosystems um, for startup ecosystems around the world. And they actually interviewed like several thousand entrepreneurs. So it wasn't the experts idea, it was practitioners in the space, their views of what's you know, what's important in terms of funding, in terms of guidance, in terms of advice, in terms of markets, etc. cetera. Um, in, unfortunately, Steve had to go to Washington, D.C., so Dennis Tsu, who's a senior director of innovation at SRI and who's also familiar with the study, will be delivering the, the, you know, the study to you. And he'll also give you a feel for SRI's engagement you know, with the entrepreneurial community. Um, if you guys, I don't know, if you're not familiar with SRI, it's really, um, it's really basically a research institute. It used to be called Stanford Research Institute, but it's now SRI. They do a ton of research in technology areas, in, in a whole range of topics, hard, hard subjects as well as 
soft, loose topics. Um, one of the things that came out of there that you're probably familiar with is Siri on the iPhone. You know, the voice recognition capability was something that came out of there and was acquired by Apple, etc. Um, and then, I'll, then we'll, do, we'll do the closing on this and probably cover anything that we haven't missed, we haven't done in that time frame. Um, so that's the, that's the agenda. Um, moving. Uh, moving forward, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. And then I'm going to ask, I'd really like to know more about you and what your needs are, etc. So then we're going to take a little time and I'd like each of you to introduce yourself. Um, given that you're going to be spending the whole weekend with me, I think I have a responsibility to give you a pretty detailed biography. So, because that's really what you're getting is access to some of my experiences, whatever they're worth. Um, I'm originally, my family is Iraqi. Um, they, they moved to Iran around the time I was born. So even though I was born and raised in Iran, um, you know, I was, we were part of the expat community in, in Iran. Um, we were known as the Arab family, interestingly. Um, and I, you know, I grew up there till I was 14, went to Israel for two years. Um, till I was 16, and then I came to the U.S. to a boarding school um, for 11th and 12th grade. Um, I then went to um, Colgate for studying international relations. Um, I thought I was interested in diplomacy and those kinds of activities. Actually, at the conclusion, I was scheduled to go to Columbia School of International Relations. Um, and for the summer, went with a buddy. We thought we'd, we went to Afghanistan, and the idea was we had a few thousand dollars. We're going to, very naively, the thought was we're going to buy some cool stuff, come back, sell it before school starts, make more money than our friends that were waiters for the summer, and everything was going to be great. We went, and frankly, it was a crazy, wild adventure. We ended up buying a tiger skin, something I truly regret, um, which was then confiscated by U.S. Customs. <laughs> so it's really, and that was half of our money. Um, we then spent most of the summer buying old Afghan guns, all of them working, these beautiful flintlock and caplock guns. We collected something like 1.8 um, tons of guns, over, I don't know, 180 guns. 180 some guns. We brought those back. Interestingly, duty free, and uh, there's no problem with guns coming to the US. Um, the trouble was, though, we went to some of these gun shows, and people were laughing at us, you know, because they were doing all these big, high power German rifles and this, and, you know, we have these things. And anyway, we didn't culturally fit. So actually, I still have a a lot of guns in my <laughs> garage for anyone interested in old Afghan guns. Um, and the third thing we did was we brought back a thousand men's wedding shirts. These are embroidered, like white on white, and then the whole thing is also dyed. Um, and of course, the quality on that was, you know, this is Afghanistan in like the early 70s. What a, you know, it was a fiasco, the quality. Um, but what was amazing was the one in 10 or 20 that actually was, wasn't a fiasco had a market. It really did have a market. Um, you know, so we were selling it through some of these boutiques in college towns in you know, New England, upstate New York. And we got a chance to go to a New York show, to New York Fashion and Boutique Show, which is a major, major exhibition at the time. We got in touch with our friends in Afghanistan who sent us a bunch of samples, evidently designed by a Dutch woman who had done some things for herself and they'd asked if it's okay if they copied it and made another sample, which they did. So we took these to New York and you gotta understand, we were a bunch of students. We really knew nothing about fashion. Our idea of fashion and design was you can have cuff sleeve, puff sleeve, or straight sleeve. We go to this show and 
based on these samples, which we don't even understand ourselves, we were like this enormous hit. So like right off the bat, Mademoiselle Glamour, you know, they were, Mademoiselle was our biggest backer. They just completely, you know, enveloped us. They gave us this big story and with them came, you know, some really prestigious retailers, including Bloomingdale's and Bendel's in New York, etc. So it was really this wild, crazy experience. So one of the things you'll realize, I really believe in getting a lot of at-bats. These were crazy moves that we did, but they enabled something to happen ultimately. Anyway, so at, coming back to the States actually, the US Embassy delayed my visa. You know, they do that sometimes with students. So, so I missed the first three weeks of school. So I had postponed my entry to Columbia for a semester. In the meantime, then this thing exploded. And it was like, wow, we're, you know, we're in the fashion business, which sounded so insane at the time. This thing became wonderful. It's really, it just grew and grew. Um, the editorial support we got initially, it stayed with us. It was really what defined the company. Um, and, and, you know, of course, we engaged with it as tightly as we could. Believe it or not, it grew to like over a thousand people working on this thing, which was far more powerful. You know, my goal was I'm going to work with the UN Development Program and we're going to try to have some transformative things. This was, you know, this was, frankly, it was a hundred times more transformative than anything the UN was doing in Afghanistan at the time, per some of our friends that were with the UN at the time. Um, and, you know, we were doing it in the U.S., most of Europe. We were doing all the, the German, the French, the English, the Japanese exhibitions, etc. And did this for about nine years, um, at which point the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan happened. And to give you a sense of my strategic, my strategic insights, um, I remember talking with a competitor a guy called Tom Freston, who said, Ellie, you know, this is over with. This is, we were in Kabul when we were having this conversation with the invasion. It's so terrible. We've got a really wonderful gig going on here and all that. And I was like, no, no, you don't, you don't get it. Look, we got through the coup d'etat, right? We got through the earthquake, so we'll get through the invasion. And it was like, no, no, like, you don't get it. It's really different. So I had the strength of my conviction, so I acquired the competitor as well for us. So now we were really big. It was a horrific decision. Like within six months, it really was getting bad. Literally, we had tailors getting killed. We were, you know, we were losing millions on a monthly basis because, you know, just the whole supply chain got completely discombobulated. Um, and interestingly, really over a course of a career, you end up seeing some crazy things. The guy Tom Freston, who sold his company to me and was for six months he was working with us as a, you know, sort of as a consultant. The idea was to do this transition so customers really still recognized him as it's moving towards us. What he started at that point in the face of like this failure, we're, we're mourning the loss of this great opportunity. He started MTV, which ended up becoming like probably the most profitable venture other than the oil companies. Um, at the time. Um, so sometimes failure of that sort is just the most wonderful avenue and opening to doing something else. When I got out of there, I was really devastated personally. Um, and my problem was, you know, yeah, I was now like, I don't know, 31. Um, and I had experience and I was married, I had two kids. Um, at the same time, I had only done you know, in Iran, we don't have a tradition of summer jobs. So I had had one job as a waiter, room service waiter, one summer. And then I had done this Afghanistan thing. People didn't even know where Afghanistan is at the time. So like, at least in my mind, I was unemployable, period. Um, and of course, I had done this venture, you know, with all these millions flowing. You know, when you're young and you don't have experience, the way I had done it was, you think I had saved a dime for myself or the family? It was all in the venture. And frankly, the venture's checkbook was my, my check. You know, I had easy access to it. 
So when it went, it went, and I was like completely without assets, without resources. Frankly, I had to borrow some money from my father to just pay expenses. That's what brought me to California, actually. That's, so I decided at a certain point, um, after it took me like three weeks or th so to, to apply to one job I saw advertised in the paper and nothing happened. I called up the guy, you know, the guy laughed at me like I would remember his, my, that he would remember my resume. Obviously, I had no clue how this stuff works. Um, I figured, hey, I better go back to school. I really need like to get rebranded, et cetera. Um, so I decided to do an MBA, which I, I proceeded to do. Um, and came out think, going, to, and I came out and I went corporate really at that point. So I went to UB Networks. I went to Tandem Computer and then rapidly I went to UB Networks, which was really a technology play and the Silicon Valley play. And frankly, it seemed like those were really where some of the entrepreneurial opportunities may have been. But I was going corporate. I wasn't going as a startup at this point. And frankly, I had felt burned by the whole startup experience. Um, Um, I quickly gravitated towards strategy and ventures. I think if you've done work with a small business, one of the big, if some of you have, let's say, family small businesses or whatever, one of the things that's wonderful about that is you see it as a whole. You know, if you're working in a small venture or a s small business, you see the supply, you see what you're selling, you get a feel for it in a fairly holistic way which I think makes you, make you smart to look. You can look at it strategically. Frankly, a lot of people who I think have experience only with large enterprises where they're in a small, small you know, department, HR department of this division or something, they never get that big picture. So in any case, I got gravitated towards strategy and new ventures. Um, I then got involved and quick, and then I got involved in some turnaround work. Um, and one of the things which I found was doing venture investments was one of the ways you could really transform the picture rapidly, really quickly. Trying to do it strategically, like, okay, let's do a new product, let's do, do a new development. It's going to take forever. You know, it could take easily a year, two years to, for something to come to fruition. Whereas if you've got a good checkbook, and the will to do some ventures. You can go start cutting deals and like, next week your, pro your sales team has some new products they can show. Next week there's press releases coming, so like, hey, this is a company that's going places. You know, it's, so that's the attraction that it's really gave. So I went into ventures and corporate venture capital um, at UB and then at Tandem and then a tandem, the turnaround turned out. If you be, we, frankly, a lot of times also these turnarounds, one of the big things you're changing is the market's perception of you. It's not necessarily even your numbers. Um, but a couple things happened. One was, um, frankly, the venture group at UB, we were making more money for the company, it was two of us, than the whole rest of the company. It's kind of like, Shocking, etc. And also, when you're doing these deals, who are you doing it with? There's a lot of independent VCs, venture capitalists, who are in the deal. You know, you're getting, I don't know, your $120,000 salary, and you were pretty happy. And then you see these guys, you know, cleaning up like $5 million on the same deal, where, which you have worked on for three months. So like, yeah, I earned $30,000 for this. He's come out with five million. It just felt like, hey, wait a second, I added more value than him. So it started creating some questions in my mind, even though I really love corporate venture capital. Because what's cool about corporate venture capital is you're not just bringing money. You bring channels, you bring manufacturing capability, you bring huge amounts of knowledge, you bring research and development capability. In any case, at that point, my thinking was shifting was, hey, I want to be directly part of the action. So luckily, the tandem turn turnaround went really nicely. Um, when we went in as the turnaround team, the value of the company on the, on the um, 
NASDAQ was 850 million. A year and a half later, we sold the company to Compaq for 3.4 billion. So there was like better than 2 billion made in, the, in a very short period of time. We then did a roadshow with Rule, my boss, um, the CEO of Tandem, and Pfeiffer, who was the president of Compaq, sort of in introducing the deal to the technology community. And over the course of this period, the Compaq stock shot up, and this was a stock deal. So it went again from 3.4 to like 4. I don't know, 5, 4.6 billion in value creation. For the management team that was involved, this was sort of like, frankly, this completely dwarfed the whole clothing business. It was just a crazy big deal. So at that point, I said, okay, I want to do my own fund. And I got out and I started up Palo Alto after I, I did the requisite nine months at Compaq, which was part of the deal we did when they did the acquisition. And I started Palo Alto Ventures. Um, very quickly, we got Philips as a client. And one of the results of that was the TiVo de deal. That's where we did some of the scenario work, et cetera. Um, I sold um, then the whole venture business, like between 2000 and 2004. You may be aware, it crashed and burned in a really, really big way. Um, later on, I'm going to show you some, some pictures on that. But frankly, to date, it hasn't recovered. Right now, the amount being invested per year is less than half what was going out in 2000. This is, what, 12, 13 years ago. Um, in any case, I sold, the, I sold that outfit and frankly went through a period, I don't know, a few year period, two, three year period of sort of not clear what the heck I'm doing. Um, blowing a lot of what I had earned over the time. And then at that point, I, I sort of basically went back to the investing game primarily with Sand Hill Angels, which is, a angel, you know, which is an angel venture fund based in um, Menlo Park. And my thought was that really the best way for me to create value, and at this point, frankly, I needed to, again, create some personal wealth. Um, so the approach I thought I would take was to actually start ventures, not to do a fund, but to do them. And, and frankly, I thought I had some insights on some things that one can do, which can create rapid liquidity. Like the thought was, can you start a venture and build it and get it to a point where you can sell it to private equity, let's say, within three years? Um, so looked at a bunch of things. Um, Frankly, I wasn't getting really excited about anything, including we were trying to innovate our own concepts. And then I thought about this one company which I had seen, and I was a customer of theirs, a company called iProfile, a US company. Um, it was a, you know, sort of a family business. They did intelligence on like the Fortune 500, doing really in-depth research on their IT function. Who are the people? What is their strategy? What is their direction? What are they buying? You know, what's contact information for key decision makers? This is really, really valuable stuff to salespeople or to venture guys, which is why I had bought it. So I noticed that they were only doing US and it seemed like blindingly obvious. There is a market for this thing in Europe and Asia as well. Maybe a more robust market than the US. So I approached these folks at iProfile and I said, look, this is my background, this is the thing, I love what you're doing. I thought, hey, there might be an opportunity to do this thing in Europe. Do you want to align together? Should we approach it together? And frankly, their approach, which shocked me at the time, but I think I understand more, was, look, we don't want to have anything to do with you. I said, you know, we're willing to, you know, <laughs> through just through some engaging, some guidance, you know, we're willing to give you a stake in the European venture. And their view was really clear. So, look, we have a great business. We really don't want to play with, you know, we don't want to do these sophisticated deals, et cetera. We just want to do our venture. We don't want to even refer people to you. You don't refer to us. Let's just stay apart. I said, look, do you have any objection to us doing it in Europe? They said, you're welcome to do anything you want, but don't expect any help from us. 
frankly, it was a crazy view from their perspective. But we said, OK, we'll do it. <coughs> Started up an office in London. And, and frankly, it was a virtual office. We committed like $5,000 to the experiment. Let's do a couple samples. Let's do a big email blast to the major sales organizations in the technology ventures. We do that. Um, it, you know, it's, the demand is huge. Within a year and a half, we've grown as big as the American company. And frankly, in the meantime, they had sort of gotten fat and lazy because, hey, it's a great business. It's bringing huge returns on a regular basis. Um, and so we approached them again. We said, listen, what do you think? We're, you know, this is what we've done. This is how we've evolved the product in Europe. And frankly, it was, we had evolved it ahead of where they were because we were hungry and in a rush. We've grown as big as you. In the, you know, it's taken you 13 years to be that size. We did it in a year and a half. Um, and they said, we're willing to, um, are you interested in buying the venture? We, we're looking at selling. We were like, we'd love to. We really do love it. So we acquired the company, in part for stock, in part for cash. Frankly, at that point, we felt like, look, we could run and we're making good money on this. But at this point, we have everything we need to sell it. The original goal was, hey, you create something, you take it liquid, you know, and then you find, seek liquidity rapidly. So frankly, we did the deal with them and like, the next day, we started doing the deal for selling the whole. We now had the Euro profile, which was the venture we had started. We had iProfile. We, we shifted their product to the European product, and the market loved it in the US. We started a little venture with like two guys called Asia Profile, you know, just to sort of a placeholder to be able to tell a complete story. And with that, we went, hey, we have a global play. These are the two brands for US Europe. We're building the one in Asia. And boom, we got it. You know, we, we sold it. Um, very, you know, very nice transaction. They're still successful. They're still going. But last year, we sold. We held on to 25%. And last year, we exited the deal entirely. Um, since then, I don't know, the last year or two, I've been involved in um, a few little ventures, a few investments, but one of my key interests is a venture in Brazil, as I said, in financial lead, online financial lead generation. And we've taken, again, the same approach. Started up with an idea and very, very little money to check it out to see, does it really resonate or not? Unfortunately, it's not exploding the way the other one did. So, and frankly, sometimes you get sort of spoiled. You have one amazing experience. You start thinking, oh, they're all like that. No, they're not. So even I get really surprised left and right with these things. Which brings me to here. So you've heard the really detailed version of my background. It's had a bunch of ups and downs, as I hope I've clarified. Um, the down after the Afghanistan thing, I don't wish on anyone, really. It was a very much. You know, you really doubt who you are. You doubt your place. You doubt if you can support your family. Um, anyway, um, is there any questions about my background or about the agenda which I put out earlier? What's the yes. process for deciding whether or not you're going to exit the company or operations? I think it's very personal and very individual. In my case, you know, I like to do things and then move on. Um, I think it would have been a very legitimate view of this is a beautiful business. I enjoy doing it. The thing is, I'm not that good an operations guy. Um, and I want to continue doing it the way, the, the, way the, the folks that we actually copied did it. I mean, that's also very, very legitimate. Um, but sometimes you see numbers that you say, I can't walk away. I have to go with it.